In my last video, I looked at a very unique 486 CPU called the UMC Green. And although it was only ever intended to be a budget SX type CPU, it was significantly faster clock for clock than competing 486s from Intel, AMD, and Cyrix. Unfortunately, it was quite late to the party and UMC landed in legal trouble almost immediately after the chips hit the market in 1994, leading to the Green's untimely demise. Check out the description for a link to that video if you'd like to learn some more. Of course, Doom was one of the key benchmarks that I included in that video, and I jokingly stated that it wouldn't be a 486 video without running some Doom. But there is a reason for that, because in 1993, when id Software released Doom, people quickly realized that a very fast system was needed for the game to run smoothly. Many other games could play well enough on a 386 before this point, but Doom was one of the first games that really needed a 486 to run well. Doom's predecessor, Wolfenstein 3D, which released only a year and a half earlier, hard to believe, kept its environments very flat. There really wasn't much in the way of lighting effects, and floors and ceilings were very basic, and you'll notice that all the walls were at simple right angles too. Doom really took things to the next level, and introduced a much more vertical 3D world, with varying height, stairs, lifts, and the iconic skyboxes that gave it a much larger feel. You had much more detailed textures on the floors and ceilings, you had lava, toxic waste, and the walls could be at any angle, not just 90 degrees. And of course you had much more realistic looking lighting effects too, and I'm really not even getting into any of the gameplay mechanics here. All of these things took considerable CPU time to render, and much of it was really being done for the first time in a game like this. I have no doubt that the release of Doom pushed some people to upgrade or buy new systems in 1993, but most people who shelled out, you know, three or four thousand dollars for a computer back in the early 90s, well, they played Doom anyway. <laughs> Here's some Doom footage I recorded recently on a 386DX33, relatively high on 386 really with a fast ISA graphics card. And yeah, it's a total slideshow, unless the game window is shrunk way down and the detail lowered, it's practically unplayable. And with things turned down so much, it's obviously not the experience the developers intended. But these were different times, and I've heard many stories of people beating the game on hardware that couldn't have done much better than a few frames per second. Everyone, including myself, was just blown away by such an amazing 3D world and graphics. Not to mention the amazing soundtrack if you were lucky enough to have a sound card too. But just throwing a 486 at Doom really doesn't guarantee a good gaming experience. 486 performance varies widely. The chips were released in a variety of frequencies, anywhere from 25 to 100 megahertz for the most popular models out there. And there can also be some pretty large performance gaps between manufacturers too. As you can see, Intel's 486SX25 really struggled to keep up and managed only about 12 frames per second. Whereas the latest and greatest that 1993 had to offer, the famous DX266, achieved 30. Really may not sound like a lot to today's standards, but that was a very enjoyable experience in those days. And also keep in mind, Doom's engine was capped at 35 frames per second during normal gameplay, so didn't really get much better than that, really. But even this chart can be somewhat deceiving. I used a system with a fast Visa local bus graphics card. VLB was a short-lived 32-bit bus. It was designed to alleviate the severe graphics bottlenecks on the old 16-bit ISA bus. Visa local bus slots were pretty commonplace on 486 boards by 1993, but many older 486 boards were ISA only. As you can see, being limited by the ISA bus makes the lackluster performance of the slower 486 chips even worse, and the faster 486s are severely held back, with the DX266 achieving only 15 frames per second, or half of its potential. If you're interested in learning more about Doom and ISA bottlenecks, I'll include a link to one of my videos in the description below. When I posted about the UMC Green on Twitter, or sorry, X I should say, got an interesting reply from Victor Nieto, aka 5095, who's done some amazing work on Fast Doom. He told me that there are some UMC specific optimizations in it, and I should give it a try. For those not familiar, Fast Doom is a project with the goal of improving Doom's efficiency, allowing it to run more smoothly on hardware that could never handle it in the past. Doom was created in a relatively short time frame, and like I said before, a lot of things were being done for the first time, so it's really not a surprise that its code was not perfectly optimized. Fast Doom was based on the source port called PC Doom V2 by Nuki KT. This was used as a base, and then lots of new features and optimizations were added over the last few years by Victor and others. Some of these are from other source ports and console ports, like the Jaguar and PlayStation versions of Doom. There were also optimizations taken from Heretic, which is based on the Doom engine, but came out about a year later. 
Even Ken Silverman, who created the build engine of Duke Nukem 3D fame, provided some ideas that ended up becoming optimizations in the render code. And obviously there are a number of improvements from Victor himself, including some optimized routines and original features like Potato Mode, which we'll talk more about later. Although Victor did the majority of the development, Fast Doom would not be what it is today without the contributions of many others, so big shout out to everyone who gave their time to this awesome project. Right out of the box, I was super impressed with the performance gains out of Fast Doom. You don't have to change any settings at all, and the game feels noticeably faster. And this is without having to make any sacrifices as far as visual quality is concerned. It really does look just like the original. As you can see, there are sizable gains across the board. The lowly SX25 got a boost of almost 40%, and the green chip saw the biggest gains at over 45, which is just really amazing. These aren't small gains and really could mean the difference between a choppy and very enjoyable experience. Even the 386DX33 saw a 36% gain, although yeah, 8.3 frames per second may not be a fun experience at the default detail level, but we will see what else we can do to improve that 386 gaming experience in a bit. One of the most interesting features in Fast Doom that I'd really like to explore today is the ability to select CPU renderers that are tailored specifically to different CPU architectures. Even though the UMC Green's a pretty rare CPU, Victor included a special UMC rendering option in the game. It's well known that the UMC Green can do integer division much faster than its competitors, but there really isn't much else known about its inner workings. Sadly, Doom doesn't do a lot of division, so the tweaks had to come from elsewhere. Victor told me that it uses some of Ken Silverman's suggestions based around the observation that these chips do address calculation faster too. So instructions like LEA, SHL, and SHR, and by the way, I won't even pretend to know what those acronyms mean, as I'm not from a programming background, especially not in those days. <laughs> but those advantages could be leveraged to improve performance a bit. I was also curious what was done to improve the 386 and Cyrix specific renderers, since both these chips struggle in Doom. And according to Victor, it all comes down to latency. Cyrix and 386 CPUs have higher latency RAM access, which is obviously not a good thing for Doom. He discovered it's possible to use the CR2 and CR3 registers as a scratch pad memory of sorts that has faster access compared to RAM, and some memory copies ended up being quicker with this method, and a small boost in performance could be realized that way. I wish I could say that the CPU-specific renders made a massive improvement, but Fastum is already so efficient that squeezing anything else out of it this way is definitely not easy. That said, I did still see a consistent measurable improvement of about 1% for the Cyrix and 3D6 chips, and the UMC chips did a little bit better at a half frame per second, or about 2%. So far I haven't touched any of the graphical settings to squeeze more out of the game. I'm especially interested to see if we can get this 386 system running more smoothly. In the original game there really wasn't much you could do aside from setting the graphical detail to low and to reduce the visible display area. This did make a big difference and the game could run smoothly as long as you could you know, tolerate a lot of squinting and some big chunky pixels, but Fastum gives you some other options to improve performance. According to Victor, a lot of CPU cycles in Doom were used for rendering what are referred to as viz planes, i.e. the ceilings and floors, and that's why he included some options to adjust this. Instead of using textures, the game can approximate some simple colors instead. There's two settings, flat and flatter. Flat looks a lot better and uses some very basic gradients, while flatter seems to be a single color and just stands out a lot more. And if you don't mind this look, it could give you some very non-trivial frame boosts and an overall better experience than taking the drastic measure of lowering the detail or the display area. In my tests here, the 386DX33 was able to gain 2.6 frames per second or about 31%, and the 486SX25 got almost 6 frames or 34%. Really not bad for just a single setting that doesn't hurt the overall experience that much. Another simple change is to get rid of the skybox rendering. Skyboxes give Doom a larger feel, but they do take some CPU cycles to render. You don't find them too widespread in all maps, so the gains will not benefit all areas like the Vizplane settings would, but still handy to buy a few more cycles. Another option is sprite culling, which basically skips rendering sprites that are far out in the distance that aren't too relevant to the gameplay at hand. Victor told me he tried to exclude some far off enemies too, but that had some understandable gameplay implications. You kinda need to see who's attacking you, so he ditched that idea. Another cool setting is around invisibility. You probably remember those pesky invisible pinkies coming at you with that sort of wavy or fuzzy looking transparency, but turns out that effect actually required a lot of CPU cycles, and it wasn't unusual to see the game start to crawl every time this showed up. In order to render invisible sprites, Doom reads from VRAM, modifies the read color with a fuzzy transparent pattern, and then rewrites it to VRAM. 
but if you have an ISA graphics card, the bottleneck can make this method very slow. There are a couple of other options available, including what was used in the Sega Saturn, which is just sort of a checkerboard pattern. And there's also a very basic flat option too. But again, you don't see these enemies too often, so it's only gonna help in certain areas. I tested the skybox settings, sprite calling, and invisibility settings individually, and they didn't help all that much, unfortunately. The gains were sort of lost in the one decimal place rounding that I did. But if I enable all three, we do see a small measurable improvement in Demo 3. Some other maps may see more benefit depending on the layout, skyboxes, and enemies, and things like that. But to be honest, I really don't think it's worth disabling the skybox, but the culling and invisibility options really don't hurt the experience much at all, and I think they're definitely worth tweaking if you need the extra performance. So if the display settings in Fast Doom still aren't enough to get you a smooth gaming experience, we have the detail level options. The low detail setting should be familiar as it's the same as the original game. Basically uses a lower rendering resolution of 160 by 200 if I'm not mistaken, whereas high would be the full 320 by 200. This makes the pixels look wider and chunkier, but it can provide a very noticeable performance boost. But in Fast Doom there's a third option called the Potato Detail Level. <laughs> Provides a very wide and chunky 80 by 200 rendering resolution. And yeah, it obviously doesn't look great, but the performance benefit is far better going from low to potato than it is from going from high to low, and there is a reason for that. Victor told me that potato mode can write 4 pixels with a single 8-bit write to the VRAM, which solves a major problem with slower ISA cards. It also avoids using out instructions to select which plane to write on the graphics card, again helping with the ISA bus bottleneck. And because of this, we see a very substantial gain in this detail mode, especially with the 386 system. Going from high to low gave us a 77% improvement, which is huge, but with potato mode, the improvement was a whopping 207% boost. 25.7 frames per second is very playable, and this is with the viz planes enabled and everything else at the default settings. Enabling the other tweaks we did earlier, like flat viz planes, Saturn invisibility, and sprite calling takes this even further, and the 386 system was able to achieve 29.6 frames per second, or a total increase of about 252%. But there's so much more in Fast Doom beyond just the performance stuff. Way too much to cover in depth today, but I wanted to share a few of my favorite features. One thing I really appreciate is that Victor included a benchmarking tool directly in the game. I'd always used Phil's benchmark pack for this, which works really well, but it's really slick to see everything built right into the menu system. And as an added bonus, there's no need to calculate the frames per second based on real ticks. Another really awesome feature that I just had to share is this. Not only can you display the frame rate in the corner of the screen, but you have the option to display it on a post analyzer card. I mean, how cool is that? Seems to be refreshing every three seconds or so, but man, I just love this feature. On a sort of related note, I just found out recently that you can create a very simple basic program to write anything you want to a post analyzer card. Just write some hex values to some specific registers and that's all there is to it. I had some fun with that earlier. Big thanks to Manaworm on Twitter for telling me about this. I definitely need to mention some of Fast Doom's sound enhancements too. Supports many additional sound devices, including CMS, Disney Sound Source, and a number of others that weren't supported in the original game. You can do PCM and audio CD music, which is really cool, and you can even select your sampling rate and lower it for better performance. Interestingly, Fast Doom and PC Doom V2, which it's based on, use the Apogee sound system instead of DMX like the original game. I believe this was done for legal reasons as the DMX system was never made open source. But hey, if Fast Doom can allow you to enjoy Doom on slower hardware, why not on some older sound devices too? You really haven't lived until you've heard E1M1 on the creative music system, that's for sure. Shout out to Tronix286 for making that happen. One minor tweak I really appreciate is that the Y axis for the mouse is disabled by default in Fast Doom. When you play the original with a mouse, it's quite annoying when you inadvertently move forward or backward when you're just trying to look side to side. I used to use a TSR called Novert to do this, but no need with Fast Doom. And last but not least, you'll notice that there are a huge number of executables in the Fast Doom directory when you install it. These are used for starting the game in different graphical modes, and you can find a full list of what these are in the README file. There's everything here from higher resolution Visa modes to EGA and CGA and even a bunch of text or ANSI modes for really slow systems. For anyone who thought Doom couldn't run like butter on a 3D6, you obviously haven't had the joy of trying it out in 80 by 50 text mode. <laughs> and there you have it. Really just amazing how much more can be squeezed out of Doom on old hardware like this. 
Victor did an amazing job on Fast Doom, and of course all those who contributed, and those who found ways to better optimize it over the years as well. I really believe that projects like this are just a testament to how much of a legendary and important piece of history Doom really is. People are still playing it 30 years later, and finding ways to run it on all sorts of interesting platforms. The most bizarre of which I've heard so far is on gut bacteria. But regardless of the platform, I have no doubt that people will still be playing Doom in another 30 years. That's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoy my channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You'll find a link to my Patreon page, as well as other useful links and information in the description below, including where to find Fast Doom for anyone who'd like to give it a try. Thanks again.